Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Not only does EWTN once in a while give me this great privilege to bring uh, men and women into your home to talk about their journeys, is it they give me the privilege of inviting them back to The Journey Home program as return guests. Uh, they've already been on the program. They've shared their journey. If you want to hear more about their whole journey, go on EWTN.com and listen to one of the old Journey Home programs. But it's, it's good to have a guest back sometimes. They can relax. They've told the journey, and but there's other issues that arise that they've discovered about the beauty of the church that they didn't completely cover the first time, and such is the case tonight. It's a great privilege tonight to have Daniel Burke back to the journey home. He's a convert from Judaism, executive director of the National Catholic Register. If any of you are involved with EWTN in a, in a big way, you know about the register because it's a, very much a part of EWTN. Um, he's got a book, Navigating the Interior Life, which I have a feeling we'll get into in a little bit. Dan, welcome back to The Journey Home. It's great to be back. Great to be back with you. How long have you been doing the register? Since 2008, and then uh, just a few years ago, by God's mercy, we were uh, acquired by EWTN. It's been absolutely a perfect a match made in heaven, if you will, uh, that relationship. So it's been uh, it's been about two years now. Maybe later in the show we'll get more into this, but maybe if the audience isn't familiar with the National Catholic Register, mm -hmm. what would you say if you were to describe it in a few words? You know, what's unique about the register, the National Catholic Register, and why they ought to read it? Yeah, I mean, it's magisterium faithful look at the events of the day. Michael Warsaw recently, and speaking about it, described it as there's a catechetical moment uh, and when our faith meets culture, the events of our day, where we have to make decisions, we have to understand how it is we can live out our faith in that moment, in that time, and the register is really there to help interpret these issues, the legal issues, the religious liberty issues, uh, threats against uh, just religious freedom in general, um, threats against the Catholic Church, criticisms, sometimes valid, sometimes not. Uh, how do we understand these and how do we uh, respond to them and, and, and uh, live out our faith uh, w in a way that would honor the Lord in, in our mm -hmm. culture? And that's really what we do. That's what's unique about us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one thing I've liked about it also is that there are other publications. I, I know of other publications that are trying to be loyal to the church. Yeah. But they can be critical of bishops yeah. when they don't think the bishops are in line. And right. I think the register is really honored the hierarchy in that way. It's not our job to, to judge those above us, but to recognize, hey, they're like us. They struggle yeah. to follow the teaching of the church. You know? Well, we make honest, we, uh, we, uh, we report honestly on challenges in the church, no doubt, uh, and when bishops struggle or whatever. But as you say, uh, our orientation is really much more positive. Uh, we see uh, the church as a place of immense beauty, uh, and the, tra the tradition of the church, the works of the church, we see the Holy Spirit alive in the yeah. church, and our, our desire is, yes, we report on difficult issues, but always with what we would call a redemptive angle. So we're not, we will never report just to talk about things, which can make people money and uh, successful and that sort of thing, but that's not what we're about. We're, we're really looking to lift up the body of Christ to better know and love Jesus and His church, and so the way we look at difficult issues uh, as well is through that lens of yeah. redemptive I really do believe, especially at a time when there's so many challenges on the hierarchy. Yeah. Bishops in their diocese, lots and lots of battles. We all know that. Yeah. And it can be very easy to start mm, nitpicking. But I, I always remember that image in the Old Testament where, where David is above the sleeping Saul mm -hmm. and he has the possibility. That's a beautiful image. And he says, that's God's anointed. That's right. You're right. It's God's anointed. That's right. No, it's a beautiful image, and I, I think it's, it's really fitting. We're not here to slay one another. Uh, we're here to bring redemption and uh, really not, uh, not to pounce, um, but to do what we can to help heal. I mean, we're a human institution, right? The, the, the church isn't a perfect institution. Uh, the Lord has decided to use us broken instruments to bring about the salvation of the world, and that's a messy affair. Yeah. And there are some who like to spend all their time talking about the mess. We like to spend all of our time talking about the redemption of Christ in the midst of the mess and through the mess and through the good. Yeah, so, yeah. It's one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So we recognize that's true about it. Mm -hmm. But then I look at me. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we've got a long way to go to to grow, to flesh that out in this world because of us. Thank God. I know you don't have any problems, but you know. Oh, believe <laughs> Hey, I go to, I go to confession uh, frequently. So. Well, you were on before and you gave your whole journey, but why don't you give a quick summary to remind the audience of what was it that opened your heart to the beauty of the church? Sure. Uh, you know, I started in a Jewish home. My dad was agnostic, and my, but my mother's more active in her Judaism but was also involved in New Age and occult and that sort of thing. My home was very tumultuous. Divorce, uh, uh, my uh, mother and father divorced, and then I had a stepfather, first Catholic I met, was abusive, and uh, uh, my home wasn't safe for kids or adults. Mm. And so uh, through that pain and suffering, I also struggled physically. I'd, my first memories of a child or of a hospital. Mm. So that all set the stage really to ask this fundamental question I needed to have answered, which was, why is all the suffering here? Mm. And if it's going to be like that, the next 18 are going to be like the first 18, maybe I perhaps will opt out of life because it was just so radically painful. And so that began a quest for truth. Um, uh, I saw a lot of darkness and really by the Holy Spirit, I think, assumed there might be corresponding light, mm. way to rescue me. I entered into exploration in the new age because it's very appealing uh, all roads lead to heaven and and uh, all the we have you know Jesus just uh, one guru and amongst Buddha and all the others um, it all sounds very interesting of course until you get an, an inch deep and realize their dramatic contrast so through that exploration I started reading the Bible uh, the book of Job ironically uh, was the first book I read <laughs> really? in the Bible yeah uh -huh. which is only only inspired by the Spirit of God um, through that ended up uh, you know through encounters with wonderful evangelicals uh, one who was a former cocaine addict treated me with dignity and respect like I hadn't been treated before he told me about Jesus I didn't convert then but uh, that set the stage uh, I ended up um, going to school in Phoenix and back to L.A. When I was in L.A., I started listening to Walter Martin yep. and uh, Bible Answer Man and a lot, uh, Chuck Swindoll, a lot of names that you are very familiar with. And they, uh, Walter Martin in particular appealed to me because of his, he always backed up what he said. In yep. the New Age, I found that the, uh, there was a great deal of incoherent, uh, inconsistent, historically conflicting, uh, uh, philosophically conflicting ideas that I couldn't stomach it with Walter at least at the very least he said this is what I believe and this is why I believe it and I could deal with that because then I can go to the Bible and say well is he yeah. is he I don't I didn't necessarily believe in the Bible but is he true to it or not that helped me um, ended up in the back of a Southern Baptist Church which I I recently visited for my right. my year of faith pilgrimage to my place of baptism which was just a glorious experience <laughs> Um, but it's, uh, and uh, the, the pastor pounced and, and, and gave me, took me through a, f a few years of study that brought me to the faith. Um, I began to study the, the apostolic fathers about then because of the challenge of a Jehovah's Witness of all people. And I picked up a book on the uh, compilation of the apostolic fathers. So I read through those for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. About 10 years in, I decided that there, Proximity and piety. Proximity, they, they were the apostles, disciples, or their disciples. So yeah. Polycarp, for instance, was a disciple of the Apostle John. Uh, Clement of Rome, for instance, was an epistle written to the Corinthians uh, in, at the same time the New Testament was being compiled. So I began the weight of their testimony because of their proximity to the apostles and the weight of their testimony because of their own martyrdom. Their piety is the other way of looking at that. Uh, began to bear some weight on how I interpreted the New Testament as a Christian. And I began to realize that, you know, the, though uh, Protestants are very good at often taking Scripture and looking at the words within the context of the sentence, in the context of the paragraph, in the context of the book, would, though systematically ignore the context of the writers, the ecclesial structures of that time, what they taught. The tradition of that time and so you had a what looks like contextual study but very limited context that began to made me quest, make me question protestantism on the whole and then uh, a turning point there was i had no concept of the communion of saints but i 
I just said to the, all the writers in this compilation, would you please, if there's one thing you want me to know, would you just tell me? And, and I prayed to the Lord for wisdom, and I re read through this compilation again. And apostolic succession is really what jumped out at me. So that, if you believe in apostolic succession, it blows up all of the authority structure in the Protestant world for the most part. Uh, the ability to administrate the sacraments, even to administer grace to us, be a conduit of grace, the grace of the Lord to us. And so that caused a major problem, because by that time I'm Calvinistic, uh, Calvinist soteriologically, justification by faith alone, uh, scripture alone. So there's only one body, there are three bodies that claim apostolic succession. Those are the Anglicans, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Catholic. Catholics are out just out of the gate. So I began to explore Eastern Orthodox, uh, because they, but they were too uh, solidly Marian, which you know freaked me out a bit. <laughs> so I bounced, I you know, went to their, even audited a seminary course on Mary to try to get past, just, okay, let me be, but as soon as they start talking about Mary as the, you know, the Ark of the Covenant and the Second Eve, I'm thinking, well, this isn't in Scripture, I can't deal with this. I was still very sola scriptoria. So the only place I could really go was Anglican. Uh, because they hold to apostolic succession, though it is not recognized by the Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox churches as valid ordination, they can at least trace back their ordination. And they were uh, historically Reformed or Calvinist theologically. Um, that lasted for about a year. The Lord put me in a local parish. I was in seminary in, in, uh, on the East Coast, but at a local parish in Colorado where the priest was converting to Catholicism, the only one. In fact, you've had him here on the Journey Home shows, Phil Webb. So he converted under Archbishop Chaput. But the only priest in the, in the whole of Colorado that's converting to Catholicism, God puts me in. I mean, there's so many stories like that. And uh, so, of course, I entered into RCIA. I left seminary. And, um, uh, you know, long story short, I was received in the summer of 2005, which we can go into a little bit later, but, uh, yep. and I'm grateful to be at home. I, I, at the peace, the rest, uh, the wrangling for so many decades of what is truth, how do we define truth, what did Jesus mean by what he said, he's very real to me, and living with that reality, I, I could never rest, but now I mm. know that you know that uh, it's, a, it's an amazing place well, to be. Well, I'm gonna have you return to that subject just a second, mm -hmm. apps like succession, just, just again to, expand on it to talk with the audience a bit about its importance. In the very beginning, Paul, uh -huh. in Romans 10, mm -hmm. says, at the beginning, how necessary it is. Mm -hmm. How are they going to be saved unless they hear? Yeah. How are they going to hear unless somebody preaches? Right. But how can somebody preach unless they're sent? Yeah. I mean, that, which I never saw that verse. Right. But that verse says at the beginning, why here we are 2,000 years later, and we got a mess. That's right, yeah. And I think that verse, and I, I haven't studied Greek for a long time, but that word sent, I think, is a derivative of apostle. Exactly. That's right. what apostle, the, being sent, one right. sent. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> really, uh, until, I mean, you know the issue. There's 30, 30, there were 33,000 denominations, I don't know, a few decades ago. Okay. And they've been growing ever since. And, and I really saw that contradiction in the church where you would have wonderful people, of course. You know, this is, this is not about criticizing Protestants or Protestant pastors. A, Pro, a, a Southern Baptist pastor introduced me to Christ, and I'm, I'm forever to eternity indebted to him for that. But, um, you know, one church to the next, uh, and everybody, you know, there's disagreement on major issues. How do you resolve that? Yeah. And unless you have an authoritative structure, to resolve that. I mean, these are not minor issues. These are issues of not, not the issues that are resolved and commonly held to, as you know, are who is Jesus? You know, is he God or not? Is he the third person of the Trinity? Is he fully God and fully man? Those are not the issues. The issues are related to how is a man reconciled to God? Yeah. Right? How do you deal with sin? How, what is baptism? What is ecclesial structure? And the, the, disagreements among Protestant uh, uh, and evangelicals is just dramatic and as many views as you can as you can count. 
Yeah, this gets in, into a neat subject. Uh, for those of you that are just joining us, our guest tonight is Daniel Burke, a convert from Judaism, executive director of the National Catholic Register. This hits on a really interesting point, because I know that when I was a Protestant, I was baptized, I loved Jesus, mm -hmm. dedicated my life. And my guess is even some of our viewers would be there. Absolutely. And this issue of we presume on, on what we've heard and been taught that I've received an adequate understanding of my faith so that I can feel confident about eternity. Right. Preachers are preaching things every Sunday from pulpits mm -hmm. to congregation, giving them hope. Right. But the question is, how do we know that what they're teaching mm -hmm. is sound enough? And one particular scripture that I never saw before I was a Catholic, actually not even till late being a Catholic, which mm -hmm. I think touching this up, is that place in Scripture where Jesus says, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. Yeah, Matthew seven twenty two, And the, the criteria that he says mm -hmm. is that he looks at the person and said, hey, I didn't know you. Right. I mean, that's a, a really interesting verse. It is. You know, how many people presume on what they've been taught and everything, yeah. and they're going to stand themselves face to face with God. He's going to say, hey, uh, who are you? Well, and that verse is worthy of a great deal of meditation, <laughs> because really what Jesus does is give us a snapshot of what our, what judgment, our judgment day is going to look like. And, and interestingly enough, if you think about his audience that he's standing before there, He's obviously trying to shake them up because that whole discussion is preceded by the road to heaven is narrow and very few successfully traverse that and the road to hell or destruction is wide and many follow that. He's really trying to shake people up and he's trying to shake people up that are following him around and then acknowledge who he is because that's what he describes as to their reason he should let them hey, into heaven. Hey, look who I'm following, man. Right. You know, I'm one of his, I'm one of his intimate group here. Right. Hey. Who is Jesus? He's Lord, <laughs> right? What, and, and so why should, well, I've been living for Jesus. I mean, this is what Jesus described. I've cast out demons in his name. I have done good works. Maybe I've fed the poor, whatever. So, you know, he, and then he says uh, this thing that really should shake us to our core, any of us, yeah. um, depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, are you serious? What do you mean well, I never knew you? Now, wait a second here. That must have been a, a, a translation glitch <laughs> because God is omnipotent, uh, yeah. omniscient. No. He knows everything. Right. Really, Jesus didn't know me. Well, and, and the secret you know is in that passage because he, he says, I never knew you. That word knew, I think, is the secret to understanding what Jesus is saying. And that word knew, translated Greek to Hebrew, is the same word that uh, God used to inspire the writer of Genesis that describes the relationship between Adam and Eve and that when they uh, experience that bond of marriage, that intimacy, the, that consummation, the word is used that Adam knew Eve. And so what Jesus is talking about here is there may be a mental ascent, there may be religiosity, uh, there may be a daily rosary and mass even, there may be whatever the, the, the acts are that seem to correspond to someone who's in relationship with Jesus, that those acts don't, buy, don't de facto define or necessitate a true relationship with Jesus. He said, I never knew you, meaning uh, that I never had an intimate relationship with you. Mm -hmm. I, when I spoke, you didn't hear me. Yes, you did these things, but we're, we're not on the same page and you didn't rest in me and my grace for your salvation. You're doing all of these things, thinking these are gonna get you to heaven, and you ignored me. And, and yeah. you know, uh, Alphonsus Liguri, a lot of the great saints uh, troubled and wrestled over this idea of how do you have somebody who's constantly in, at mass or constantly doing good things for the Lord, but yet uh, they don't have love, or, or they're judgmental, or they're constantly critical of others. All they do is criticize the church and other people, they seem to be destructive in their personal relationships. Well, the answer is really found in this verse, and that is that if there's not a true intimate transformational relationship with Christ, where we truly experience the promise of John 14, that I will manifest myself to you, Jesus said, 
If we live in this covenant of love, if you love me and you keep my commandments, we live in this covenant of love together, I will show myself to you. The, the Father and I will dine with you. Uh, we will make our abode with you. Um, if that knowing is not present, we should be very uncomfortable hmm. w with our relationship with Christ. Yeah, in that context of Matthew, you talk about the end of that chapter ends with the sheep and the goat. Right. Whatever you did to the least of these, you mm -hmm. did to me. There, right. There's a sense in which the church is always taught. And again, the, this is one of the reasons why we we have the Journey Home program, is, mm -hmm. is we want people to discover the beauty of the Catholic Church, not just so they can be checked off on their list whether exactly. they're Catholic or not. Right. It's this issue. How do you know that you know him? Right. And how do you know he knows you? And the way you do that, part of it is, in the face of the poor, right. you know Jesus. Right. Mother Teresa was absolutely committed to that her whole life. Mm -hmm. How do I know Christ? How does he know me through that poor person? It's, you know, and the church helps us discover that. And I think part of the reason that you wrote this book is this is also something you came to discover even after becoming a Catholic. Is yeah. It, right? I mean, well, and, and it had started before. I mean, it obviously fully matured as a Catholic. But part of the story I didn't tell last time when we were together was that I had a dramatic encounter with Christ. I mean, I came out of what I would call a hellish environment, uh, uh, state of soul. And uh, when I came to know Christ, everything in my life changed. Now, I was instantly freed of some things that others struggle with their entire lives. Some stayed with me, but he was real and present to me. Uh, and I struggled with, but I struggled with my prayer life. What does this mean? As a Calvinist, as you know, uh, mystical experience of Christ. And mystical experience, all, all that means is it's personal. He, he really, do, he really <laughs> it does walk with us and talk with us and tell us that we are his own. That, that wonderful old hymn. Right, right, in a reality, right? And so uh, it can be strange. So when I was looking to Calvinistic literature, uh, because of the threat against Sola Scriptura, the perceived threat, uh, Scripture alone, uh, the, the prominent theologians were very negative about this whole thing about experiencing Christ. So I remember as a Presbyterian pastor, yeah. I would not allow my music director to have us sing that song. That's that, that very, he walks with he me. Walks he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me of his own and the joy. Because you get it all in the Bible, right? It, it doesn't fit. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. fit Calvinist theology. So right. we couldn't sing that hymn. It, in, in, it, in, yeah, <laughs> it's outside of the ink and paper. And so, yeah. So, um, and I also struggle with aridity and things like that. There's just no place to go. There, there are charismatic traditions in Protestantism and Wesleyan traditions, and there are areas that tend to be more uh, informative about those things, but nothing like, of course, the Catholic Church. So I came upon uh, Catholic literature of, mystic, of the mystics of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila and a number of others. She, she's been become kind of my, she was my uh, patron saint, and, and uh, I can tell you a little interesting story about when I was received into the church. But um, uh, I began to read that tradition and began to find hope, you know, uh, that aridity is a normal process mm -hmm. of maturation in the spiritual life. Uh, I b b gained hope that I was not insane when I did, when the Lord did show me things, when he did, you know, put a person's face almost, almost in physical form in front of me so that I could grieve for them and pray for their soul. You know, these sorts of things occurred so that when I was feeling what you might call elated in worship, in his presence, that this wasn't just something that I drummed up psychologically, but that it was the work of the Holy Spirit in my soul. So I learned all that through Catholic mystical tradition. And then, it, but of course, a, a lot of it was through a Protestant lens, right? <laughs> and it took becoming Catholic and then reading it more broadly and studying more broadly, which has become in, in many ways a focus of my own uh, work. And the EWT and the register are my number one priority, my number one. But the Lord has also raised up this whole apostolate where we help people to learn how to pray and teach them uh, about spiritual theology in the church and that sort That's of thing. That's the uh, www rcspiritualdirection.com. Yeah, and RC stands for Roman Catholic, rcspiritualdirection.com. And so we have, uh, uh, it's the largest, most widely read uh, blog and information site on faithful Catholic spirituality. Mm -hmm. And wonderful thing is, because of my association with your show, by the way, from my last appearance, 
I've had a number of Anglican, of Anglican bishop, uh, Anglican priest. One just came into the church this Easter. Uh, uh, his name is Father Donald True, he's a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, is, uh, is being able to, to also uh, give them hope and patience and courage <laughs> and uh, point to the glory of the tradition of the church and, and the spiritual riches of the church that are available to them. Uh, um, aridity, I want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I'll give you an example and you tell me whether I'm, I'm on the right track or not. I, I remember one of my sons when he was younger, playing cards with him. And we liked to play cards. But there were, because of where I knew he was at in his own maturity, mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he didn't deal well with losing yet. Mm -hmm. So there'd be times I'd be playing with him and in my hand, I had two or three opportunities I could have won that game right now, yeah. but I didn't. Yeah. I let him win. Yeah. We played and he would, it would, but then there came a time over time when I'd start playing those cards. Yeah. Not so that I could, one up him, but he had to understand not just winning but losing. Right. That's a bit of what aridity is all about in the spiritual life. Yeah, it's a great analogy because early on, it, just to expand a little more as well, the, the, when you're letting him win those hands, that's what often happens with converts or with people who are just beginning to take their lives, their spiritual life seriously. God gives them consolations. Yeah. He gives them wins. He, he makes things very easy for them. Maybe they'll overcome a particular sin easier or they're able to pray longer than they ever thought or whatever. He gives them those consolations. But yeah, I mean, to grow up, we have to deal with the challenges that eventually are going to require our own exercise of our will and often very energetically so, in order to overcome things that hinder our relationship with, with him. So aridity is, uh, in, in many ways, now there are different reasons for it, but in this case, aridity's purpose is purification. Mm -hmm. So it's a purgation that uh, enables us to better prepare us, it better prepares us for that relationship with Christ in this life, gets things out of the way, out of our heart and our soul that occupies space that God desires to occupy. Um, but it also prepares us for the beatific vision in heaven. So yeah, that's a great analogy for All right. our reading. We're gonna take a break, Dan. Uh, we'll come back in a moment. Our guest is uh, Daniel Burke. He's the uh, executive director of the National Catholic Register. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. Our guest is Daniel Burke. He's the executive director of the National Catholic Register with EWTN. Yeah. Uh, www.ncregister.com. I also wanted to make sure that I clarified he is the author of Navigating the Interior Life, Spiritual Direction, and the Journey to God. And I uh, highly recommend the book. And highly you can find it on EWTN Religious Catalog as well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier well, two things that I wanted to kind of go back to. First of all, you had mentioned earlier in your journey that uh, as you're moving away from Calvinism into this spirituality, as you're exploring, there were Protestant groups out there. You mentioned the Charismatics yeah. and the Methodists and others that were into spirituality. Right. Um, so why not stop there? Yeah. Yeah, there are a couple of reasons. One is I honestly didn't find many, and I read pretty broadly, in the Protestant world, many who d could describe the things that I experienced uh, in any level of detail. So that was one. But the other was just the typical Protestant challenge of who do I listen to yeah. and what's true and what's right. Um, so in, there's in one way you can trust an author, which is really what it always gets down to in the Protestant evangelical world is a, a particular author that you trust. But there was no true guiding 
authority that this is the pure water that Christ has for us and this is not. Whereas with the magisterium, we have, you know, one of the, I'll give you an example, one of the writers that actually helped me was condemned as a heretic by uh, the Inquisition, rightly so, because he went off the rails. Now, there was a little piece of his teaching that helped me on aridity that was actually in keeping with the church, but rightly so, there are other areas where he went way off track and there were, uh, and it led to immorality and other things like yeah. that. So with the Catholic Church, we have this thousands of years of wisdom that has tested these things mm -hmm. over and over against the teachings of the church as given by the apostles and their disciples and the, the, the teaching that's been giving, given through the scripture, through author, other authority and writings, that sort of thing, to help us to really sift through and determine who is rel re reliable and why, and then we can rest in that. Yeah. So the doctors of the church, of course, are the best place to find your spiritual enrichment. There's, you know, certainly I recommend and publish, we publish modern authors like Ralph Martin, who's absolutely fantastic, yeah. and Father Thomas Dubay, who I miss so, yeah. so, yeah. so, yeah. so deeply. Um, but the way we judge their writings and determine if we can even lean on them is whether or not they're faithful to the historic magisterium, uh, Holy Spirit inspired teaching of the church. You know, and not long ago, there was a bestseller about a doctor who had gone into a coma, <clears throat> came out of it, and then he had experienced heaven, at least as he understand it. And he's written a book, bestseller. I've not read the book. I've only seen a little bit. Of it, so I, don't, I can't promote it. But the point is, that being aside, the topic is you have a spiritual experience. Who's going to help you understand whether it was true or not? Right. How do you how do you understand it? How do you how do you explain it? Mm -hmm. um, who is a trustworthy voice out there to say whether that was of the Lord or of the devil, mm -hmm. or you know the world, the flesh, and the devil? Yeah. And and that's thank God He gave us this church, this community of the baptized. Yeah. So we know within that we are authentically. And it, it, maybe another point to get to in this whole area is. Is humility important? Ah. <laughs> I mean, it's huge. I mean, it's the doorway. I, T Teresa of Avila in her interior castles uh, describes two necessary elements, essentially, to cross the moat and begin to enter into the door of this castle, of this wonderful uh, relationship with God that, we, that he has prepared for us, that he desires for us. And she said that the two things are uh, reflection and prayer. And when she talks about reflection, what she means is gaining a, an accurate understanding of who we are in the context of God, where we are spiritually in the context of who God is and what he's done for us, what he desires of us. And what she talks about is that draws us to humility. Another example, St. Catherine of Siena in the Dialogues, in her inspired writings where she reveals the conversation with, the, with our Heavenly Father, that too begins with, uh, the school of humility as a necessity. And so part of a necessity uh, that the spiritual doctors of the church, both of Catherine and, and Teresa are doctors of the church, uh, reveal to us is that we must begin this exploration of God and what he desires of us, who we are on our knees. Hmm. We must begin on our knees because if we begin on our knees, we begin then in a place of recognition of who we are and that we're nothing, and that if he desires to give us nothing, then we get what we deserve. But that if he desires to give us more, we must be so open and docile and listen and yield our wills to the Lord and say, not my will, but thine be done as Christ did in the garden. And then we're ready. Uh, and of course, this is a journey, right? Uh, you know, we, we, those of us who love the Lord get humility one way or another, usually the hard way. But as much as we can will it, even at the beginning, uh, to the degree that we are humble, to that degree, the Lord will uh, answer us. He will hear us. He will tell us. He will guide us. and He will lead us. So it's absolutely essential. Yeah. You mentioned also early on that the reason that you, you, in your journey, turned your heart away from even considering the Orthodox Church was it was too Marian. 
Did you grow beyond that? Well, there's a lesson. <laughs> Where, where's in Our Lady? <laughs> there's a lesson in humility. Because well, Our Lady is a hard one for a lot of non-Catholics. When I so I was in RCIA and I call and I was attending mass, and uh, I believed in the real presence, and I I, I believed that Jesus was present, body, soul, uh, and divinity, all all there. And I was watching you Catholics, because you were Catholic then, uh, go get to take partake of that amazing banquet feast of Christ. And it drove me crazy because I did not want to wait. I did not want to go back to RCIA. <laughs> so I called the head of the, the, uh, the program and I said, look, I said, I will submit. I agree that the magisterium is the authority of Christ in the church. It, it's what, and I said, I don't, I said, I'll just be open with you. I don't get this Mary thing and I don't get justification by faith. It wasn't clear at the time. I said, but I will I know the church is God's church and I know the magisterium is true and I will submit to it and I will figure it out and whatever the church teaches, I will follow it. And so in that way, I approached Marian devotion, particularly the passage, Romans 8, where it says, uh, oh, nothing, um, honor to whom honor is due, you know, is, is the passage that I remember. But, uh, and I thought, well, if, if Christ asks us, and if the scripture itself gives honor to Mary, and it certainly does unequivocally, right. very clearly, through the archangel's words and other ways, but if scripture itself uh, does that, and if God inspired that scripture, then it would be appropriate for me to honor her. And if I did so, I would not be taking due uh, honor from God and giving it to her. Instead, actually, I would be giving due honor to God by giving it to her because he did. So I'm following his footsteps. So I began to pray the rosary. Uh, at that time, it was only a decade a day was my commitment. And I just did it out of duty. And I've just, of course, and I write in my book, learned to rely on Mary. And, and you know, the, the pa I love this uh, rosary passage where it, it talks about Mary taking Jesus to Elizabeth. And I always, uh, when I pray that, I always say, Mary's pre please bring me to Jesus, bring Jesus to me, help me to know him because you, you knew him like nobody else. So, and then since then I've begun to pray the rosary, uh, daily, the full rosary daily, uh, I mean uh, uh, one right. mystery a day. Yeah. And uh, I've never looked back. So. All right, all right. We got an email, Lenny from South Dakota. And I know you've mentioned a few of your spiritual writers, but he asked, does Dan have a particular saint or devotional book that he finds especially helpful in his spiritual life? Besides the own that you've but My own, no, that's not, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple, um, Divine Intimacy. If you're talking about how, books that give you daily meditation, uh, I published one called The Better Part, and it, uh, it goes through each of the Gospels. Uh, it's beautifully written. It teaches you how to meditate and how to reflect on the Gospels. Another one by a Carmelite uh, is called Divine Intimacy. Um, another one uh, is called In Conversation with God. Uh, so these are all wonderful texts from different spiritual traditions in the church. Divine Intimacy is Carmelite. The better part is more Ignatian. And In Conversation with God comes out of uh, Opus Dei, but broad tradition in the yeah. church. So those are a few that really, on a day-to-day -day basis, can provide profound nourishment, drawing the heart to Christ. As you've explored in spirituality, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you began coming at it from a Protestant perspective and you were exploring there. Yeah. And it's sometimes getting off into what you found out later was not valid. Right. And then you become Catholic, so you discover the beauty of the, of the boundaries of the church. Uh -huh. And you, you discover the great greatness of Catholic historical spirituality and all that. After you've come home and you're comfortable and you know the boundaries, have you been able to comfortably reach back to non-Catholic traditions to find spirituality that still feeds you? Hmm. You know, not really. Uh, not really. Because the analogy I would use is if, if you lived in a village with a well and... Um, and you'd relied on that well, and there, maybe there was one a little bit farther away that n never had an issue. There, nobody ever got sick from drinking that water, but the well that you were drinking from, occasionally people would get sick, but for the most part it was, was good. Um, which well would you choose? Uh, and for me, even though the, the, for a while the Catholic well, if you will, 
was a little bit further away, a little bit harder for me to understand. And I was still, you know, I was very much blessed in my faith in, as a Protestant evangelical. But uh, the well does have impurities in it. And I, you know, frankly, I, look, uh, I was talking with uh, uh, Bishop Connolly, and he's a convert. And I said to him, to me, the Catholic Church, the spirituality of the Catholic Church is like being in a candy store as large as the Northern Hemisphere and being a candy addict, you know? Okay. I mean, it's just, we just don't have any lack. I mean, you could, spend, <laughs> you could spend your entire life in Carmelite spirituality, your entire life in Ignatian, your entire life in Franciscan, it, uh, and any other numbers, and, and, you, and it's the pure water of the Holy Spirit. So why go anywhere else? Uh, you know, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, I, I agree. I think what happened for me was a, after my conversion and then the discovering the beauty of the church and my first introduction into Catholic spirituality was uh, Garagul Legrand's little oh, yeah. book on the three ways of the spiritual it's, it's life. Not his big one, but his yeah. little one. And it was like, because it was so scriptural. Yeah. It was really a scripture study. And Great that, Dominican scholar. It was. It was like, whoa. Yeah. And because I had read John of the Cross earlier, and I didn't, didn't quite collect, you know. It takes time. You know, it's kind of yeah. like Flannery O'Connor. Just yeah. did not connect at first. Well, then once I read Gary Lagrange, then I went back. It's oh, okay. Yeah, it makes this sense. is what John of the Cross means. This is true. But what I found later, and it maybe took me 20 years as a Catholic, because what I had done was all this Protestant stuff I'd put up on the shelf. Right. But what happened is then I dipped back into C.S. Lewis. Oh, of course. Now there are. I some dipped steps, back yeah. into uh, yeah. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah. And it's like, all right, now. Yeah. Now I can hear them. Yeah. In a more trustworthy way, I can see where C.S. Lewis. There's some things because of his own formation that he's missing a little bit. Yeah. But where he's right, he's right. Yeah, no doubt. No, and and the church recognizes, of course, uh, Nostra Aetate out of the Second Vatican Council points to the light of God that does shine and, and reveal itself in traditions outside of this, the heart, the most pure tradition of the Catholic Church. And certainly C.S. Lewis is one of those lights and Screw Tape Letters is an oh. amazing book that every Catholic should read. Amazing, amazing. amazing. Um, the Great Divorce, I mean, all of those. So yeah, I agree with you. Uh, so, but even so, you know, the spiritual doctors of the church I found to be my yeah. mainstay. I did reread Screw Tape recently and, uh, 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 it, because it's so powerful, you know. But Noah from Northern Michigan writes, I converted to the Catholic Church three years ago and love being Catholic. I'm a little concerned, though, since I don't see much deepening of my spiritual life, and I don't really feel any closer to God. I want all he has to offer, but feel like I'm not going anywhere. Thanks, yeah. Noah, for your email. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's some basic things that you can do. One is is I would ask how frequently are you going to confession? If it's not every two weeks and you're in that feeling that you're, you're there, uh, I would recommend that with the very, uh, what you might call a rigorous examination of conscience because there may be some things hindering your spiritual progress that the Lord will reveal to you in that sacrament. And of course, then you have that grace, that special grace that comes and enlivens your spiritual life. The other is a daily practice of prayer. I mean, I'm assuming this person is is attending mass every week and not not in deliberate uh, mortal or venial sin, but um, a daily time of mental prayer, learning how to pray on a daily basis, where you enter into that dialogue with the Lord. That can start as uh, vocal prayer, which is the, really the best place to start, but it needs to then move into meditation. And in the book I mentioned earlier, the better part, where we teach uh, Catholic meditation and how to meditate on scriptures might be a great way. There's another one by Jacques Philippe called Time for God, <clears throat> which helps to introduce uh, folks to mental prayer. So those are some ways to where really are necessary to really m more fully encounter Christ that, that Catholics need to practice. Um, the daily office. <clears throat> yeah. Talk about, if you would, the beauty of that. Because I, I have found in our work that many clergy, yeah. Converts to the church just doesn't click for them, and it's. Uh, I love the liturgy of the hours. Yeah. I was I was praying it this morning, and there was this wonderful verse about uh, the end prayer of the of the morning prayer, s talks about this great privilege of being able to praying that we would be given the gift of serving God's people effectively. And I thought about coming to talk <laughs> with you, and I was moved 
by that. But yeah, the Liturgy of the Hours is so beautiful. It takes a little work to learn, and it's a form of vocal prayer, which can also turn to meditation or mental prayer if used properly. But yeah, I recommend to every, any Catholic, if you're struggling with getting into a rhythm of Catholic prayer, and maybe even the rhythm of the Liturgy of the Church, that um, the Liturgy of the Hours will help you get into that rhythm in a beautiful way. And of course, <clears throat> it's primarily made up of the Psalms and reading of Scripture and praying the Scriptures. But also there's canticles and, and other things that really draw your heart to the Lord. And that's a great, that's another yeah, great way to begin uh, uh, morning prayer. Especially love the, the Office of Readings. Yeah, I, I mean, you get these glimpses, little tidbits into the early fathers, and, and even all the way up to the Vatican Council. But yeah, you get writings of the saints, and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and council documents, and you really uh, can get a real broad understanding of Catholic spirituality in many ways through the Office of Readings, which precede morning prayer every morning. Yeah, well, the, the, you know, the two, I could hear two people saying, you know, What's, what's this important of vocal prayer? I mean, God, here's what I'm thinking. What, what's the important, what's the value of, of vocal prayer? I, vocal prayer has a number of just really practical values. One is that um, the vast majority of people I've ever talked with struggle with distractions in prayer. And so vocal prayer is a way to use your entire body to worship the Lord. So you use your mouth, your vocal cords, your mind, in a way, and then you're hearing, because you're hearing it, in a way that helps you to take all of your senses, and it's in a really powerful act of yeah. worship uh, that then helps you to focus, if you, if you pray it properly, on the Lord. So I think, uh, yes, extemporaneous prayer is very important, and actually it's what we call mental prayer in the Catholic tradition, and it's what we want people to do. But um, vocal prayer can be a way to focus your uh, your mind, your heart, your will, all your senses, and even spe on specific types of prayer, like in the rosary, meditating through the life of Christ, uh, through the eyes of Mary, can be uh, very powerful, and, and you can experience the Lord in unique ways in vocal prayer that are different than in mental prayer or extemporaneous prayer. Given your research on this, I'm wondering, uh, is it particularly helpful for those who have come from traditions, Christian traditions outside the church where their spirituality is almost Gnostic, where there's this separation between the in, internal Me. Uh, connection with God and my physical yeah. is not an important part of my spirituality. Right. Whereas what you just talked about is a very incarnational way of understanding us. Yeah. You're right. A wholeness of who we God's given us, mouth and mind and, and everything. Well, and you've done a good job of illustrating that. Beyond that, back to your uh, your idea of uh, the Liturgy of the Hours, when, uh, as Catholics, like you and I pray together every morning, and I, and, and I haven't seen you for a year, but the reason we do is because we pray the Liturgy of the Hours. Yeah. So Liturgy of the Hours is a liturgical prayer. It's a, it's a, it's a church-wide prayer where when we bend our knees and, and uh, enter into this kind of prayer, we enter into the prayer of the entire church, uh, priests, religious, faithful lay people who pray it. So there's, uh, there's, there are more dimensions in Catholic prayer that are just so beautiful to be explored uh, for folks just coming in. Liturgy of the Hours is, is a great way. And with that, again, this, this private vocal prayer, uh -huh. which those that come from non-Catholic traditions just doesn't quite right. make sense. Yeah. Like I said, it brings together the whole person. It does. You're yeah. not caught up in this Gnosticism, it's just what's going on inside, he can hear me, yeah. you know, and, and what I do with my body is not important. No, we're one being. That's right. Body and soul. Yeah. And so that's, especially for those coming into the church, this is a good place to, to get, you feel like a step backwards. No, no, it's not. Is... No, it's not. That's, you're right. I actually had that sensation, as a matter of fact, because as an evangelical, you know, you, as a child, you might have, and I taught my kids, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So sometimes a Protestant conception of vocal prayer is that. But of course, we know, uh, and even I learned through the Anglican tradition, that some of the beauty of these prayers is beyond what I could ever come to uh, reciting on my own anyway. But yeah, you. you what about I, I think, chant? Oh, gosh, <laughs> that's my favorite. Uh, 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 as a former headbanger rock and roller, and then uh, converting to 
uh, evangelicalism and moving into Striper and, uh, and Petra and all of these other things. No, I've had to learn to quiet my soul. And the interesting thing about chant, which a lot of people don't realize, is that one, it's designed originally so that anyone can sing it, whether you're a good singer or not, whether you're a good vocalist or not. And so that would allow all the people of God to engage in, in worship through song. But the other thing about it is, is for whatever reason, the way it affects the soul, at least mine and I know many others, is that it doesn't disturb prayer. And so a lot of these other influences outside in rhythms and uh, re repetitious lyrics and things like that, which may or may not be harmful, uh, with chant, you're, it's always about God. It's, it's almost always on scripture or truth about God. But uh, because of the particular construct of the melodies and the way that it works, uh, it doesn't disrupt your soul for for prayer and can draw you to prayer. So I have a lot a lot of times chant in the background. I love I love absolutely love love Catholic chant. All right, I wanted to make sure. I know we talked about it earlier in the program, but I, you know we've got a couple minutes left. I want you to talk more about the ministry of uh, the register. Oh yeah, and so you talk a little bit more about that and and uh, you know how's it gone? Fantastic. In, yeah, in the last couple of years, especially connected with EWTN. Well, of course, coming to EWTN was a great blessing to us. It rescued the register. Part of my devotion to Mary, why I pray the rosary in, in whole every day, and why I wear a scapular, was a specific intention to Mary to, to save the register because we were struggling. Uh, but when we came into EWTN, things completely turned around. I mean, we had a lot of things going for us. Our web strategy was working very well at the time, but the financials were problematic and subscriptions. Uh, were problematic. So since uh, being acquired by the Register, we've had a dramatic increase in print subscriptions. And I, I don't know of another print publication other than maybe Magnificat, but not like an, a newspaper out there that's growing. Uh, and so we're up over 35,000 wow. subscribers now. On the web is really where we're making a, a, a huge dent. Last year we had, uh, well, I'll give you an example. In 2008, we had 800,000 unique visitors to the register website. In 2012, we had over 8 million. So that means there were more than 8 million different people who came to the site to argue with us, to learn more about their faith and how to live out their faith, that, to learn about uh, political issues, uh, social issues, to learn more about how to be how to better uh, worship the Lord and, and uh, embrace the liturgical seasons of the year, like Advent and Lent, um, how to learn more about pro-life issues. So uh, being with EWTN has really freed us up from this constant scramble uh, of financial challenges and, and other difficulties to really focus on just providing the best content in the world uh, in the news realm, which EWTN is so clearly committed to, as you know. Um, right. uh, so it's just, I, you know, I can't say enough. Uh, work, the organization itself is an absolute delight to work for. I love working around Franciscans because I'm very intense. And uh, the Franciscan culture <laughs> at AWTN is a little more laid back. And uh, I've really enjoyed that. And uh, the legacy of Mother Angelica is just beyond amazing. Well, what I was going to say is, I mean, the part of of Mother's, uh, Angelica's openness mm -hmm. to the leading of the Holy Spirit, oh, yeah. uh, yet at the same time being faithful to yeah. the church. I mean, then that's really it. And I mean, I, I don't remember seeing uh, any evidence that early on she ever thought about having a newspaper, yeah. but in the res but responding to the needs of the church, the needs of God's people, was, there's the, the newsletter right in line with her vision. Well, it's interesting you say that because uh, Michael said that when he went to tell the nuns, he went to the monastery after we uh, we were acquired by WTN, and uh, and he told the nuns. They said to her, they said to him. Mother always wanted a newspaper, right? <laughs> to be able to do what we do, you know, to yeah. advance, the mission of, the, of EWTN is to advance the gospel as defined by the magisterium of the church, which is exactly what we yeah. do in the register. So it's been a match made in heaven because, the, you know, EWTN really understands media, of course, yep. better than anybody in the Catholic world. And uh, so it's just been an uh, absolute delight and things are going very well. All right, all right. Once again, everyone, uh, Dan Burke's book, Navigating the Interior. What was the other book you said you also had another one on? 
I, I'm uh, working on a couple books on prayer, but this yeah. this is this is what's out now. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. All right, navigating the interior life. You can get that with EWTN. Uh, dot com. And again, ncregister.com, in case you aren't subscribing to the registry, you'd like to find more about it and uh, be one of those eight gazillion people that check on their website <laughs> to find out more about what they're doing. Dan, thanks. Oh, it's been great. It's always good to have you in the show. Got to have you back again. And uh, thank you for your witness, too, and, uh, and what you're doing leading the register. It's a great work. By it's God's mercy. God. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope Dan's journey has been an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you.